Thank you, Jason. In his 1962 Sorry. book, Profiles of the Future, an inquiry into the limits of the possible, seminal science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke wrote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And for the last few years, what we've seen emerging out of um, artificial intelligence, generative AI, and unsupervised deep learning has been nothing short of magic. So to demystify some of that magic, we have three expert panelists with us today who will talk about their own profiles of the future. Erica Alden De Benedictus is a group lead at the Crick, where her lab uses robotics accelerated evolution for protein design. She also founded the Align to Innovate nonprofit, improving their reproducibility, shareability, and scalability of experimental data. Erica will talk about the creation of high throughput data streams. Thanks. Um, so I want to I want to start with a story, which is that when I first when science first captured my imagination as like a high school student, it was not biology. It was space science. Um, I did astronomy. I went to like astronomy camp and I observed asteroids and I in early undergrad, I, I worked at um, JPL doing like mission design for space missions. And, and physics was this incredibly enticing discipline for a young scientist because in physics models work, right? So you can actually plan orbits to Mars for spacecraft with like pretty much nothing more than Newtonian physics. And they're like basically pretty much right. Um, and so midway through undergrad, I had a friend who had worked at D.E. Shaw Research, where instead of applying computational physics to the solar system, which is mostly vacuum, they apply computational physics to biology, which is full of God knows what. And so I, I went to D.E. Shaw Research, and I tried to simulate proteins, and I was just shocked by how bad we are at it. Um, and, and to this day, I mean, that was a long time ago. Even now, we're still really bad at at simulating biology with traditional sort of bottom-up physics approaches. Um, and for folks in the room who are like more on the industry side, I'll, I'll give you another reason why you should be like deeply worried about our ability to like predict biology, which is that in at least US patent law, you can write prophetic patents in many disciplines like computer science because you can write down an algorithm and like it'll work, you can prove it will work. Um, and there are other disciplines like chemistry and biology that are the unpredictable arts. And those are the ones where you actually have to do it before anyone is gonna be convinced that it's a good idea, right? Um, so fast forward to just a few years ago, um, AlphaFold comes out. Um, AlphaFold is in many ways our first like non-trivial example of a computer model that replaces an experiment. So instead of needing to go into a lab and crystallize a protein to see a snapshot of what it looks like, you just punch it into the computer and you believe it. Um, it AlphaFold is as good as or better than experiment for certain types of proteins, um, which is really astonishing. And it's a indication, maybe just one indication that the, the sort of computational paradigm of machine learning might actually play nice with the structure of real biology and it might offer a general way for us to build predictive models and make biology more like physics, a discipline where as like a high school student or an early undergrad, I could actually do physics research with no resources other than a laptop, um, both scary and uh, exciting. Um, so, okay, so, so here we are. We have some indications that maybe machine learning is sort of the answer to making biology less horrible to actually make progress in. Um, and we are massively data limited, right? Um, biological systems are super complicated. And when you think about what it took to make AlphaFold work, um, there was lots of really great engineering that went into it. But in addition, it took 50 years of like biology field work to generate enough data to train that model. Um, and if you do the math, uh, it works out to something like 10-ish billion dollars worth of data that went into making our sort of first and still only really predictive model in biology. 
Um, fortunately, again, as a former physicist, that's easy, right? That's like the order of magnitude of CERN and Hubble and every spacecraft that has ever been launched, right? Um, and so I would suggest that we, as a field in life science, we may be at the point, this inflection point, where we need to really grow up and do more big scale projects to make more of these models. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Simon is the founder and CEO of Latent Labs, the company working on foundational models for synthetic bi biology. Before that, Simon spent five years at DeepMind, where he was a team lead on the science team working on the protein design problem and a machine learning researcher on DeepMind's AlphaFold 2. Simon. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'd like to speak about how do we push the design of biology in silico. And I would like to start with an observation, which is that in civil engineering, you'll be hard pressed to find anyone today building an actual physical model of a bridge to understand the strains and payloads it can take. It's all done in CAD using finite elements and whatnot. And then, you know, they ship it, they build it, it will work. So why does that not work in biology? Why can we not simulate basically what happens in a cell? And I want to talk a little bit about the complexities there before I go into what I think could work in that domain. So one of the problems here is the sheer complexity of the task. Essentially, if you think about an average human cell, it's comprised of tens of millions of protein copies, each of which are made up of up to several thousands of atoms. Now, if you apply molecular dynamics simulations, for instance, to that, they're just, these simulations are just way too brittle and not general enough to be able to deal with that let alone can we use the compute to really compute these interactions on any meaningful time scale to make any progress here. Also, another um, yeah, interesting observation in that space is that essentially the physics of proteins doesn't seem quite as fault tolerant as the physics that governs the macro world. So if you make a small point mutation if a protein, that can literally bring down an entire cascade of interactions, which actually often is just called a disease. And um, in, in sort of our macro world, that'd be sort of akin to saying the type of nail in a wall sort of matters as much that it can sort of bring down a multi-story building. That's the type of magnitude we're talking about. Beyond that, sort of a cell, you can look at it as a sort of dynamic mass, if you will. If you sort of imagine the inner workings of a cell, I would say think of it as a dense soup where different constituents sort of randomly bump into each other all the time. So proteins, DNA, RNA, small molecules, they all sort of bump into each other, bounce off each other, sometimes stick to each other, sometimes a protein finds its sort of interaction partner as intended. That's sort of akin to saying you wanted to find someone in London to speak to a particular person, and in order to do that, you have to go around sort of randomly talking to the whole of London. That's sort of how our cells work and how signal transmission works in a cell, and that's sort of really astounding. It works, but it's definitely really hard to model. Now, to complicate things even further, um, proteins are these sort of wiggly, jiggly bees. They're really dynamic, and often that actually is important in their functioning. So when they interact with another protein, for instance, they might have to sort of change shape to do that. And modeling that in and of itself, again, is, is a really tough task. So given all this complexity, how can we make any progress here? And what I want to say um, with respect to that is maybe we should take a step back and think about what we want out of, out of a simulation like that, which I think is two things. We want to understand what happens when we make a perturbation to that system. And we also want to sort of engineer new functions into a system like that. And here I want to sort of basically say that we've made a lot of great progress with machine learning uh, today. We're much further along than what was possible three years ago. Today, using systems like AlphaFold2, we can predict pretty accurately the structure of proteins. Often, we can actually use machine learning to understand the variant landscape of a particular protein family. We're starting to be able to design antibodies to a specific antigen. So that stuff is starting to work, actually, today. And um, what's interesting is, I, I think, that we've basically taken, with AlphaFold and other tools, an interesting middle ground approach, which I think is a very interesting um, dogma. And that middle ground approach is one where we're combining sort of physics inspired machine learning with new sources of data. And why that's interesting is because we can essentially soft bake in our prior knowledge about a problem into a model. And that keeps the model nice and flexible, not as brittle as molecular dynamics, 
while also sort of profiting from the flexibility of learning from data. And that's a really interesting and strong paradigm that I think has a strong chance of actually getting us pretty close to a, a fully close to physical um, sort of simulation of, of cells. Indeed, we're seeing people making progress on these problems today. We've seen recently interesting models um, essentially tackling the dynamics problem, combining again ML and in this case, time-resolved cryo-EM data. Of course, this is only the beginning. Uh, there's a lot to be done. I think one interesting leap towards this goal will be generatively modeling all interactions um, that happen in the cells, so protein with DNA, RNA, small molecules, and the like. And if you allow me that plug, that's what we're working on at Leighton Labs. So naturally, I'm very optimistic about progress in that field. I think in the past, experiments were the main workhorse uh, for biology, and that's still the case today, really. Um, more and more, we're seeing data giving AI models a leg up, and they will be less reliant on, on data. And I think, sort of, like I said, that sort of combination of machine learning with new sources of data will probably be a winning ticket. And I think we're making our way towards a future where essentially the job of a biologist may become sort of similar to that of a civil engineer today. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Patrick Schwab is a senior director of machine learning and artificial intelligence and head of the biomedical AI group at GSK. His work aims to advance personal medicine using machine learning, computational systems biology, and healthcare data sets from a multimodal perspective to better understand and treat complex diseases. Patrick. Thank you so much, Mariola. I think this set up to be a really interesting discussion because I'm going to make a contrarian argument here. Yes. And they asked me for my most spicy take about machine learning for drug discovery. And I'm going to make, I'm going to talk about the biggest misconception that I think that I've seen so far in machine learning for drug discovery. And is in some way in a position to you too. I think more data is not always better. And I'm going to explain, and I think there's going to be a picture that, uh, I'm going to explain using a picture why I think that's the case. Um, but I'm going to start to make two arguments actually. The first one is obviously data is super important and is the foundation for the progress of machine learning. We've seen it in AlphaFold with the PDB. By the way, a lot of times the underlying fundamental data sources, they don't get nearly as much attention as the uh, models that are built on top of them. But PDB was the key enabling factor there. Uh, nowadays, we're seeing a lot of progress in sequence learning models, DNA sequences. That's, a lot of that is based on public data generated in ENCODE, Phantom 5, these types of databases that really enable that type of work. Um, so data, clearly extremely important uh, for machine learning. But I think a lot of people make the misconception and the mental leap to say, oh, because data has been successful in so many cases in the past, collecting more data, irrespective of what I'm collecting, is always better. And I think I'm going to make the argument that is not the case. And for that reason, I've actually stolen a picture that um, Bernard Schurkopf uses a lot. Uh, Bernard Schurkopf, if you don't know him, is like a machine learning for causality guy. And um, I think the mental mistake that is really underlying a lot of this misconception is if you look at the central picture here, um, you're immediately going to think, okay, this is just a chair. And it's the thing that you expect it to be. And I'm going to argue a lot of the experiments that we do are exactly that middle picture. So we're going to maybe perturb it with various perturbations. Maybe we're going to shoot light at a different electromagnetic wave with different wavelengths. It's not going to give us actually the understanding of what this chair truly is. And then only if we switch our perspective, we look at what's actually underlying this chair. We're looking at the right and left side view of the same chair. And we're actually seeing the underlying mechanism that gives rise to this chair. And so no matter how many data points I collect at this central picture, I'm never going to understand the mechanism that's going to happen from the other viewpoints. And so I think this is the mental uh, leap that many people make as a mistake, a fundamental mistake in terms of the machine learning for dark discovery. We see a lot of companies founded on the principle of collecting a lot of data in certain cell systems and assuming that that will be useful for the side views. But that is not the case. And I think that we will learn over time uh, that it was a fundamental mistake that we've made. Um, and there is a cautionary tale, and for that I will actually ask the audience here for a quick show of hands uh, scenario. Um, assume you're some kind of CEO in a biotech, and you're getting a target um, for a phase one decision, whether or not you're going to invest 20 million in the phase one trial. And you have a data on this target which essentially tells you, okay, in vitro evidence, amazing, in vivo evidence, amazing, and then somebody also did some TCGA analysis, and it shows actually this marker in TCGA if it's different in people that, are, that have it in the highway, the, they essentially they get um, uh, higher mortality, right? So you're, 
have some evidence that it's involved in that. Um, would you, would, how many of the people here in the group would count that evidence as a positive thing, a negative thing, or just neutral? What do you think in terms of a uh, positive thing? Is that a positive? Do you think that makes the target better? How many people think it doesn't make the target better? How many people think it's, it doesn't make any difference? The people that said it doesn't make any difference have it because actually there has been studies on this and people have done that for, there's evidence, like there's hundreds of thousands of papers, like thousands of papers, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of papers that tried exactly this, that the TCJ analysis and you would find various targets that are involved in various cancers. And then later, uh, the, the, these last few years, people have done studies systematically to find out is that a signal that is enriched for good drug targets? And the answer is no. And so you can see how often we make this mistake. And this picture, by the way, is in 3D. Uh, you can imagine how many more opportunities you have to make a wrong view onto something if there's thousands of dimensions. And so, yeah, I rest my argument. Uh, amazing. Thank you, Patrick. We're going we're gonna to come back to that idea just in a little bit. OK. So the past, present, and the, present and the future of automation-driven biology, yeah. let's ground ourselves in the past a little bit. Artificial intelligence, if defined broadly, isn't particularly a new technology. Uh, the promises to deliver some of that same precision medicine were made decades ago by the bioinformatics era. That's the time when we all scrambled to build out what essentially was a hairball. Um, is this emergence of deep learning models in biology, is it all hype? Is it a breakthrough or is it a natural progression? And how are your organizations responding to it? I'll let Patrick go first, given that he has had the spiciest take. <laughs> I'm going to be less spicy about my answer here. Um, I think there is an element of natural progression to these developments, which is it allows you to do certain things just incrementally better. But I think that's missing the point of the potential. And I think some of these longer term visions that my previous speakers have alluded to are really what excites me the most about machine learning. And also things like, I talk about causality, but also things like just understanding the wiring diagram of the cell. They're becoming within reach of what we could do with some of the data that we have. Under some of the caveats that we just don't know all of the things that we could measure yet. And so there's always that caveat, we don't actually know what to measure and we don't actually know how many things there are out there that we just simply don't understand, that we simply don't see in the data that we collect. And so I think in terms of that, there's an element of humility that I would like to transmit to the team. Whenever the group here, I think whenever you feel like you're getting close to solving something like biology, just understand it is extremely, extremely complex. And I think it will be the last thing that humanity will actually solve. So if everything else in the world is solved, biology will still be there uh, because it is such a complex system and it wasn't made for human interpretation. It was made uh, by evolution randomly in some process, and that doesn't actually make it very, very interpretable um, from, from that perspective. So I think hum humility is a big argument and a big uh, element of this, but I do believe in the long-term potential of potential transformative capabilities, speeding up the process, and we also have to understand what is the baseline, right? What is the status quo that we're currently comparing ourselves to? And I'll be the first to admit we're pretty bad today, actually, at doing this kind of thing. The success rates, as you know, roughly 5%, spending about a billion to develop a drug uh, is not a sustainable thing. And we have so many different diseases out there, so many different conditions that we still need to treat that really deserve being treated. And so I think we need to do better and, and hopefully machine learning will be a conduit for enabling that. Thank you. So how can founders build an AI first biotech company and what pitfalls should found founders uh, Avoid, especially in the light of ever advancing enterprise model systems. Edmund. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think what's really important um, when you're building in the intersection of maybe machine learning and, and biology is that you're grounding yourself in data and in a problem. Like I think it's it's easy to sort of fall into the trap of trying to just basically build very general tools, um, sort of without an application in mind and. And if you're sort of lacking perhaps a good sort of metric that, that shows where you're progressing, you're sort of perhaps building, you know, a bridge where you don't need a bridge. So grounding yourself in a, in a problem, I think, is, is extremely valuable and, and useful. So that's, that's basically one of the, I think, uh, advices I would give um, when, you're, when you're working in that intersection, even when you're looking to, you know, build something what perhaps I've described, like a very general approach. 
So do founders really need artificial intelligence when something like a PCA or a linear regression can get them to a, a, an inflection point or a business decision first? Yeah, I think that that question really depends on the application. Like sometimes sort of finding a similar solution, uh, sorry, similar sequence to what you already had will do. So it's maybe a search problem, which, you know, you can do with very simple methods. And we've been able to do that for decades, like you're alluding to, I think earlier, um, there's been, you know, good examples of machine learning around since a long time. But then as the complexity perhaps of the task increases, I think, um, yeah, you basically machine learning does sort of offer a step change often. Um, if you look at AlphaFold, for instance, like Erica was saying, and you know, I'm biased, but I, let's take it from Erica, that, you know, it, it can obviate experiments. Not always, you know, you'll, you'll have to sort of do it smartly and sort of question what you're seeing, but it, it can, and definitely it can give you hypothesis without having to sort of, you know, go at the full length of crystallizing your protein and, and sort of bombarding it with uh, electrons and then sort of fitting a model into it. And sort of that takes months, uh, if not a year sometimes. So um, that really has brought these times down tremendously. And so I think that was a real phase transition in, in that light. Would you say that the field of biology is uniquely positioned to use physics-driven AI compared to other application areas precisely because of the data constraints that come with it? Eric or something like that. Well, I actually think biology is sort of delightfully amenable in some ways to like digital readouts because you have DNA. So you can like do things like, um, you know, input is sequence, output is prediction of entire transcriptome when bacteria is grown in this media or something like that. I mean, the biology kind of even more so than chemistry is like super digital in the types of prediction problems you could try to create and solve. What, what negative outcomes do we need to avoid as we apply AI models to biology more broadly? Maybe Patrick can expand on his thoughts on uh, adding in more data streams that don't necessarily uh, resolve the underlying biology that we're interested in studying? I'm going to give two part answers to this. Um, I think the first one definitely is in the realm of trying to understand the diversity of biology, and that means going beyond reductionist approaches and going beyond just doing something because we can. And I see this mistake actually as a very central mistake. Um, we like to do RNA sequencing. Why? Because everybody can do it. It's cheap and it's scalable. That's not why we should do it, but still we go to it all the time and everybody makes this mistake. Um, although it's already proven that it's very poorly correlated with the proteome, very poorly correlated with other morphological features of the cell. So very, very poorly as a measure of, of outcomes, very poorly um, suited. And so I think we definitely need to think more from first principles. What are the right things to answer the question that we have? And we need to understand better what are the things that we can even understand. And uh, I, I like to talk about drug discovery as kind of the science of the pragmatic. So you need to be able to kind of understand within the realm of the things you can address today, what can I do? And I think it's, it's, it's amazing to think about the future and the vision, what might be possible. But I think some of these things are 20 years off before they get practical and can actually be done. And until we get there, I think it's really about pragmatism and understanding, okay, what's within the reach of the tools that I have today? And every tool that we employ, including machine learning, has an operating range. And if you're employing it outside of that operating range, it's not going to work. And that's not going to be a surprise to anyone. Um, the second part of the answer I will give is some of this will resolve over time. Uh, because we are in the beautiful time where there is just a general technological advance also in molecular biology, which we're kind of riding on in any case. So we're getting a lot of new technologies for measuring stuff, including some of the things we may not even know yet that we want to measure. Uh, some things that we may already hypothesize are important. For example, dynamics, very clearly important in biology, but something we almost never measure, never, never understand. And so I think a lot of these elements, I think we will learn over time that they are more important than we thought. And as we get to measure them, we will understand, okay, this actually explains some of the variance that we had in terms of the errors that we made. And uh, I think that's going back to the first point I made about humility. I think we also have to understand we just don't have all the tools today to answer all of these questions. And that's why we need to be pragmatic. Where are we today with our operating range? Yeah, I, I like your humility, humility point, and I think actually, uh, like, I often think if we understood biology, we would be so unhappy. Like, we don't want to go learning how all these things inside the cell interact. Um, 
people like structure of proteins because it's interpretable. You can look at it and you could be like, oh, yes, here's the alpha helix. Like, oh, yes, like this residue moved half an angstrom this way. And that's why. And dynamics is unsatisfying to study because you can't tell easy stories that we have language for about it. Um, and so for that reason, I'm also a pragmatist. Like, I don't care what my protein looks like. I just want it to work. Right. And we need to think about what proteins we want and perhaps their therapeutics or proteins for climate or whatever. But um, yeah, I also think that should drive like how we make models and what we want the models to do. Very cool. I myself am passionate about noise. What are the constraints and bounds of they say things like gene expression or dynamics of proteins? And that is really hard to encode, especially in these dimensionality reduced models that we've suffered through over the last few decades. Okay, to move on to the future, what do you think are the next grand challenges in biology that are especially amenable to this form of predictive modeling, whether it's unsupervised deep learning or physics-driven AI? What can we tackle maybe now, and what else do we need in order to tackle the, the big questions of homo and silicus? So I have a bunch of models that I want. Um, because I am a bad experimentalist. I don't want to go to lab anymore. So here's the things I want. So we already have, you type in the sequence of a protein, you get out a one picture of its static structure. Um, I'd also like to be able to type in a sequence of a protein and what, you know, where I want to express it and get an accurate prediction of whether or not it will express, right? Because uh, secretly, you don't care what your protein does if you can't manufacture it, right? Um, I'd also like to be able to punch in uh, genome of entire organism, comma, CAD file of the bioreactor and then get out a read of the, of the um, like, number of grams that I get out of this reaction, right? Like, I want to solve scale up with a predictive model. Um, and there's a lot of people trying to do these right now. I mean, a whole cell model is, is also on the table, right? Like, how much single cell... RNA-seq, I know you hate it, but how much single cell RNA-seq do we need before we have a whole cell transcripto model? Um, I would argue these, these models are probably possible, it's just they require more data than we have right now and certainly more data than we have curated and in one place so that you can train from it. And it requires someone to go think about which ways you could image the not chair, right? You want the meta model. I want the meta model. Um, and I think some of these are, you know, maybe even pretty easy. I mean, uh, protein sequence to expression, I think we could knock that out like pretty quickly in like a couple years. Um, protein sequence to function, that starts getting harder. Uh, I want a model where I type in a natural language sentence about what I want the protein to do. You know, I want an enzyme that, you know, converts this into that at room temperature and is, you know, whatever. And I want it to spit out a sequence that just works like the first time. Um, and those things, again, there's no physics reason why I can't have them. We just don't have the data to back up these models. I want the series of morphogen gradients that I need to make an emergent tissue grow out from a single cell. That's what I want. Simon, what do you want? What's on your list, your Christmas list of models that we want to see? I mean, a lot of what Erica said, but right, you don't even have to stop at, um, you know, cell level modeling. You could even go to sort of organism level modeling, by which I mean something like, you know, to ground it maybe in, in sort of therapeutic applications as well. Something like a model of the immune system and maybe make that personalized, like be, make that promptable with like a person's, um, you know, uh, sort of perhaps, perhaps genetic history or genetic makeup and, and then get a, you know, model of that person's uh, immune system, understand how that would react under perturbations, by which I mean, you know, introducing an antibody, introducing whatever sort of therapeutic agent and sort of in silico understanding what that does, that'd be amazing. An N of one clinical trial exactly. using an algorithm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's algorithm. of course, I, I don't know, that, that you will be like, that's a pipe dream. But, I, you know, I think that's maybe two decades out or three decades out, we could probably come up with models that do that kind of thing. It's Simon far is out, an but... optimist. Patrick, are you also <laughs> an, op uh, an optimist here? I think whole human simulation is a little longer off than 20 years, but um, let's see, we can make a bet about that. Um, I think uh, my wish list actually would be much closer to what Simon said. Um, I think ultimately, I don't care so much about what a cell does, because the reason we do these cell experiments is not to understand the cell. We can already do many cell experiments. We want to understand the human, and the human is ultimately what matters to us. I disagree, but okay. 
if you're a drug developer. Obviously, there's more basic fundamental science as well that's interesting. But I think from a drug development perspective, what we want to do is understand the human. We do cell experiments to serve as an understanding source for understanding the human uh, with poor historic success rates, right? So it's already we know that the cell experiment is not really predictive. So it doesn't help us a lot if we're able to simulate the cell, actually, because it's just going to give us more data that's not predictive <laughs> of what we're doing in the human. Um, so ultimately, I think I would much rather see something like a uh, human simulation. We're way off there, and I actually think that's where the realism comes back. I think the path will go through simulating smaller things first. And that might give us the bottom-up construction of some of these more complex things, but that's going to be a long run. All right, I will let Erica make a counterpoint, and then I, we will take one or two questions as we are running close to time. I mean, look, if I think uh, I get it when you're sick like yourself you think that infectious disease is super cool but like there are other cool things we could do with biology that as a discipline we're just not as practiced as thinking about it and like certainly climate is high on that list um i would say also you could set your sights farther so like the thing i want is a microbe that can like grow by itself out outside on mars and produces greenhouse gases to heat it up right i mean we could like biology is the thing like the most powerful technology we know of that's like like infinitely scalable when you get it right. Um, and that's something we just don't have the, like we don't know what happens when you put biology outside. It's like a huge risk and that's why we don't do it. But if you had a predictive model of will X grow in this environment, maybe you would suddenly feel comfortable doing that, right? So, so there's, you know, even new applications, whole new areas of application open up when you start um, being able to re really predict what biology will do. Thank you for, uh, gra well, not grounding us, but making us think more globally. Okay, one or two questions. Please wait until the mic is brought to you. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, my name is John. I want to ask a question to Patrick, uh, since he's been antagonizing a little bit this <laughs> evening. So you have looked to convince us that in vitro and in vivo evidence um, is not really translatable, um, which I agree with on average. That said, I've been involved with several drug development programs where you, ha you are able to observe a phenotype in humans, um, and that then leads to an FDA approval relatively easily. So kind of doing reverse translation. So do you agree then that um, if, would you change your argument if the biological data that is gathered to then train the AI is fully focused on those phenotypes in humans? And I hope you say yes, because that's the thesis of my company. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna uh, disarm your company, but I think um, you make a good point, but also I kind of love this argument because this is always what people would say. There's cases and anecdotes where this worked, and that's why it's the right way to do it. And I just fundamentally don't believe it, because there's hundreds and thousands of other cases where it didn't work that we don't talk about. And then I think the fundamental argument I'm making is not that the data is never useful. I'm saying we don't know how useful it is, so you can't tell apart the case when it actually is working. So you don't know. When you see what is good, is it good because it's true? Or is it good because you're being misled by the picture that you're looking at? And I think that's the fundamental problem. And that's why more data is not better, because you just have more opportunities to be misled. Well, survivorship bias, right? We, we actually need that negative data that we don't, we don't often see. Yeah. Uh, but that gets us into an entirely different paradigm. So we'll save that for another panel, another discussion <laughs> in the future. Thank you, everyone. I won't hold you up from dinner. <laughs>